I was asked to talk about percutaneous valve implantation for the tricuspid position, and this is mostly um, uh, preclinical work at this point, but there is some clinical data which I will show you. Uh, by disclosure, I do receive speaking on our area from Edwards, Medtronic, and St. Jude, but I'm not a, a consultant to any of them. So the tricuspid valve as a target for transcutaneous therapy, this is not something new. This is something that was thought, uh, I, I think, thought of shortly after um, um, aortic valve um, percutaneous therapy started by Cribier back in 2004. People immediately came upon this idea, but the problem is that the tricuspid valve is rather tricky. There are some advantages to it um, that is favorable access either through the femoral vein or you can use a transatrial approach, which I'll show you, or maybe possibly a transventricular approach. And the other thing is that you have more time to implant the percutaneous valve because there's no rapid pacing that's required and you can sort of take your time to be 100% sure that you're happy with the location before deploying the valve. And you may also uh, speculate that there may be some advantages because it's the lower um, pressure system that that may translate into increased durability over time, although that certainly is not the case for bioprosthetic valves in the um, tricuspid position. But there are some definite disadvantages. So the lack of the firm fibrous annulus is a problem in order to get, there's nothing really good to anchor your um, percutaneous valve to. Massive annular dilatation, which frequently is seen in these patients, resulting in annuli, which are way bigger than any uh, percutaneous device. Um, the fact that these patients often have associated severe RV dysfunction or pulmonary hypertension. And then there's uh, anato anatomic uh, uh, considerations with the coronary sinus and the AV node, although that's not really too much of an issue. But the massive annular dilatation, um, I'll discuss that in a couple more minutes. That is a particular problem. The dilatation of the tricuspid annulus in secondary tricuspid regurgitation tends to be in the direction of the anterior and posterior, and there's not as much uh, dilatation that occurs in the septal area. And uh, this is obviously a non-circular um, uh, shape and therefore is not optimally suited to um, transcutaneous devices. And if you put a transcutaneous device inside of a massively dilated tricuspid annulus, even if you had one that's big enough, there's no guarantee whatsoever that the annulus won't continue to dilate in the future and that you will develop then paravalvular leak. So that is a real crucial problem for uh, percutaneous therapy. This may be one uh, solution to that problem. There's not much about this in the surgical literature, but there's a couple of papers looking at an edge-to-edge, -edge, so like an Alfieri-type technique for the tricuspid valve, and that may enable percutaneous therapy um, in patients that have a native tricuspid valve. So this is a paper in Annals of Thoracic Surgery from a group of surgeons in Beijing, and uh, this is the only good diagram I could show you, unfortunately, but you get the point here where they basically suture together the tips of the three tricuspid leaflets, and that is analogous to what you see with an Alfieri uh, um, operation, which is in a pig here on the top right, or the mitral clip, uh, which you're, um, I'm sure, aware of. So this may be something that some uh, companies, startup companies, are working on right now, trying to get the three tips of the leaflets together with one device. I'm just not aware of it at this point, but I'm sure somebody's working on it. There's so many people pouring into this area and so much money pouring into this area. I'm sure someone's working on it. Another option for patients with native tricuspid valve and severe regurgitation is to leave the valve alone but to target the inferior and superior vena cava by putting valves or valve devices inside of the two uh, cava. And this has been attempted uh, by a group from Jena. Uh, this was in sheep. And what they did is they harvested the pulmonic valve from sheep, then uh, uh, attached them to a uh, self-expanding nitinol stent, and then went ahead and released these through the jugular vein, going down into the inferior vena cava, and then sequentially releasing one valve uh, conduit in the inferior vena cava, and then one in the superior vena cava. But uh, to the best of my knowledge, this has not yet been attempted in humans, although I think they're just around the corner, just about ready for it. <clears throat> one, uh, one problem with that is that, again, the size of the devices that are required, because the inferior vena cava, as you all know, can be massively dilated. So in order to find a biological valve that's that big um, and uh, is going to be uh, not straightforward. This is really the 
perfect patient is the one that you see on a regular basis, patient that's been already operated on three or four times, has a bioprosthetic valve in their tricuspid position, and it's failing. They either have stenosis or insufficiency. And I really think this is going to be where the, the future of these procedures is uh, as we get more and more experience. And we, so this is a valve in a valve type of procedure, and this concept uh, has been already thought about and examined and been shown to be uh, clinically feasible in the aortic position in many, many patients around the world. And we're just starting to get experience with this also in the mitral position. So uh, the advantages are you do not have to have a stenotomy, you do not need cardiopulmonary uh, bypass, you do not need to arrest the heart so there is no ischemia, and, um, and therefore it should minimize the uh, morbidity for the patient. And it's certainly a lot more technically feasible than somebody with native uh, tricuspid valve disease because you have something that's circular and it's firm, so it can got good purchase for your percutaneous valve. So this was the first time that we performed this in, in the aortic position. In 2007, we uh, wrote a, uh, one paper on it at that time. This is a more recent update of the paper. 11 patients in the aortic position, all 11 received a successful valve and valve implantation. None of them died and there were no strokes. So this is an imminently feasible procedure. And the nice thing is, as you can see on this uh, uh, diagram here on the far left, you've got the, the previous bioprosthetic valve stents, which are sort of serving as a goalpost for uh, an 11-meter shot uh, here on this side of the Atlantic or a penalty shot on the other side of the Atlantic. And um, this has been also uh, done clinically in humans. This is the largest uh, experience to date. This is a multicenter study that was put together. Um, principal author is from Sydney, but as you see, there's uh, uh, experience from Columbus, Ohio, Munich, and uh, Gießen, uh, and Boston. And what they did is they uh, gathered 15 patients all together. All of them received a melody valve. All of the patients had a previous tricuspid valve replacement, and the results were uh, very good. This is showing the um, NYHA classification pre- and post-procedure, so there was symptom improvement in the vast majority of the patients. And as far as com complications go, it was a, a safe procedure. One patient died of multisystem organ failure who was very sick before the procedure, two days postoperatively, and one patient de developed AV block requiring a permanent pacemaker. And these are just some diagrams of two uh, typical patients. Um, on the left, uh, this is a patient that had a previous bioprosthetic valve. On the right is a patient that has a RARV uh, conduit. The one big limiting factor here is that these are, uh, the melody valve is not very big, uh, 22 millimeters, and therefore you need small tricuspid valve prosthesis. But you can also put a valve inside of a ring. Um, this concept we, we've done in multiple patients now at our center. I think we're up to about 15 now. Patients that have had a previous mitral valve repair for ischemic MR, we know that those patients are particularly high risk for recurrent MR afterwards. And so we started looking at, well, maybe we can put a percutaneous valve inside of their ring. This is the most common mitral valve ring here. It's a physio. It's complete, or com most commonly implanted at our center, I should say. It's complete, it's semi-rigid, but you can see a problem with it. If you put a circular percutaneous valve in there, you can end up with uh, paravalvular leaks at the two commissures. It is slightly distensible, so we have, if we size it perfectly, we have had a couple of patients with no paravalvular leak, but we've also had some with paravalvular leak. But the other three that you see in this diagram are, are different rings that are commonly used in the tricuspid position. And as you can see for the bottom left, for example, the Carpanchi Edwards Classic, which is very rigid, that just isn't going to work at all. The Cosgrove Edwards, uh, which is incomplete and uh, partial, that will work. And then the Duran, which is uh, uh, complete but um, um, flexible. Sorry, I meant to say the top one, the Cosgrove Edwards, is incomplete but flexible, and the Duran is complete and flexible. Those will work. We haven't done one yet uh, in a patient, but uh, we're, I'm sure it was, it's just a matter of time. And we confirmed that this mitral valve, ring, valve in a ring concept 
uh, is feasible. This is a sheep study that we did. I'm sorry the video doesn't run, but we uh, did macroscopic inspection, found good purchase of the uh, percutaneous valve against the mitral ring, and uh, we also did some uh, Newton meter uh, testing to see what the forces were needed to dislodge it, and the forces were certainly above normal physiologic uh, limits, which you would find inside of the heart. So we felt quite comfortable that we were ready to go ahead and do it in humans, and as I said, we've done about 15 of them, and then this was our, our one sheep that we took out to 12 months as well, showing good function of that percutaneous valve. It's a sapien valve. So here's the only patient I have to present for you. Uh, but if I come back in a year, I'll probably have a bunch more. <laughs> so this is a 42-year-old fa female, very young, uh, but she had severe uh, symptomatic tricuspid regurgitation with ascites, peripheral edema, and uh, NYHA th uh, three symptoms. She had myocarditis and required a pacemaker implantation when she was only uh, n uh, nine years old, then required a uh, tricuspid valve repair a few years later, then had a re-mitral and tricuspid valve repair in 2004, then she presented to our center for the first time in 2006. At, at that point, my boss, Fred Moore, did a minimal invasive from the right side, mini thoracotomy, tricuspid valve replacement, put in an EPIC 31 millimeter. Also, the patient needed another pacemaker implantation at that point. And she has renal insufficiency at current time and also biventricular function, left ventricular EF about 45% and right ventricular about 30%. So this is obviously somebody who's very high risk, fourth time, massive ascites, um, fully decompensated right uh, ventricular failure. Uh, this is her pre-op chest x-ray, not so subtle there. She's got a lot of hardware, hardware in place. And then this was their CT scan, which we wanted to see because we knew she had been operated already from the right-hand side, and we were a bit wary about opening the right thorax again. But when we saw this CT, we felt quite happy about it because we could see there was a large pleural effusion, and so therefore the adhesions were not going to pre prevent our access, which is right there. So we felt quite comfortable, based on this, just to go ahead with the transatrial approach. Um, here's her interoperative TEE. So this is her uh, EPIC uh, valve. And as you can see, there's um, a lack of co-optation between the leaflets. The leaflets are uh, sclerosed and uh, not uh, closing or not co-opting. There's basically free uh, uh, TR and, uh, as I said before, biventricular dysfunction. And here's our setup. This is not that patient, but this is our typical setup for minimal invasive mitral valve surgery. We have a camera, which was not needed for this case. Here's the camera here. But you get the idea here. We make about a five centimeter incision, put in a soft tissue retractor, and then uh, you get a good vision of the atrium. Um, and in her case, we didn't need any other incisions because we weren't going to give cardioplegia. We weren't going to cross-clamp the aorta. This was the only incision that we made was this, was this uh, five centimeter incision here. And um, here's the, uh, um, the two valves in place. It's a little bit subtle here, but this is her mitral valve ring, her physio ring. And then this subtle line, circular line here is her epic um, valve. Some bioprosthetic valves are very easy to see. Some are difficult to see. EPIC is one of the ones that's difficult to see. And uh, so the sheath is now introduced through a purse string suture in the free wall of her right atrium. And uh, as you see, lots of hardware in place. Now we position the sapien valve into the EPIC. You can lightly see the EPIC ring right here. And we know from our mitral valve experience, we want about two-thirds to three-quarters of the valve below the ring and one quarter to one third above the ring. So once we were happy with that positioning, uh, we, here's the final position where we thought it was good. We don't need rapid pacing. We just go ahead and take our time, slowly dilate it up, and um, got a very good result. And here is her um, post-TEE showing a good function of the sapien valve with no uh, regurgitation, and she did extremely well, very high risk, and uh, she was uh, um, out of the, uh, the ICU in, in three days and home from the hospital in a week, which in Germany, that's a very fast discharge. There tend to be longer uh, lengths of stay than here in Great Britain or in North America. So transcutaneous tri tricuspid valve ther therapy is currently feasible, but only in highly selected patients. Prosthetic tricuspid valve disease is the perfect patient, and I'm, and I'm sure we're going to be seeing more and more of these in the future, either transatrial, transfemoral, or possibly transventricular. Thank you very much.